Hello, everyone, and welcome to National Human Genome Research Institute's second event in our new Genomics and the Media series, Conversations with Science Communicators. Uh, my name is Sarah Bates. I'm the Communications Chief for NHGRI. I'm very excited today to give a short introduction before I turn it over to our moderator and special guest. Uh, Preprints, scientific manuscripts that appear online before formal peer review or publication in a journal or a book. It's one of the biggest topics that public affairs offices and journalists are dealing with now and have for several years. It came to national attention with the COVID-19 pandemic and an influx of preprints. Uh, and our special guest today will explain, will explain more about what preprints are. Uh, strangely, most of the public doesn't know about this nuance in the scientific uh, publication ecosystem. And yet it's something that is incredibly important to how they understand science news. And it depends on conversations like the one we're gonna to have today um, to talk about how we adapt to these new changes in the scientific communications landscape. So this, this event is one in a series of outstanding uh, speakers that we're going to have talk to us here at NHGRI. Each one features a trailblazer in science communication, talking about their craft and taking questions from you, the public and journalists and everyone else. Um, each guest is an expert in communicating about genomics across very various media, from podcasting to preprints to everything in between. Our goal with these conversations is to talk about different approaches for communicating about the fast paced field of genomics to give you behind the scenes about how people break the news or talk about the news, and as well as to discuss the unique challenges and opportunities that each medium can present. We had an incredible lineup for the series from Dorothy Roberts to Elizabeth Wayne to Joe Palka to Porva Mandavilli. And today, of course, we have our incredible guest, uh, John Inglis, who is the executive director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. So I will turn it over to our moderator to, uh, to give a greater introduction for John today. Dr. Chris Dunter is our moderator. She is a senior advisor for the NHGRI director on genomics engagement and head of the Genomics Methods Unit, or EMU, the NHGRI Social and Behavioral Research Branch. Uh, you may know her as Girl Scientist on Twitter. So please send us your questions on social media. In the meantime, throughout the conversation, Chris and John will be looking out for them. Use the hashtag genomics in the media, or you can drop them in the Q&A feature on Zoom. Thank you all for joining us today, and I will turn it over to Dr. Spencer and Inglis. Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and welcome, Dr. John Inglis. I'm so excited to have a colleague and friend with us today. So John earned his PhD in immunology from Edinburgh University Medical School, and he served as an editor of The Lancet before founding the journal Immunology Today. In 1987, he was lured over from across the pond to the U.S. to start up Laboratory Press, and since then, he has founded almost more journals than I can list in the time that we have together. More recently, he and his colleague Richard Sever co-founded two preprint servers, BioArchive and MedArchive, if you've seen those written out, the X in them is a chi, um, which we are going to talk about at length today. But even if you haven't met John in person before, if you work in genomics, you have almost certainly used a tool that he helped produce or set up. So thank you so much, John, for joining us. It's my pleasure, Chris. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about you came to the U.S., as we mentioned, to set up the Colesman Harbor Laboratory Press. And right then, the journal Genes and Development was just six months old. And I am going to out myself as old by saying that I certainly remember when every lab had well-worn copies of Molecular Cloning, the second edition by Tom Maniotis, the laboratory man. I see now that that's listed as a collectible as Amazon, which makes me feel even older. So tell us about how you were able to build up the press from that small start to the big enterprise it is today. Well, you know, I was ref I was thinking the other day that really the reason that I came here is actually because of genomics. And the reason was that the director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory at, in 1987 was the very famous James D. Watson, who um, had been the director of Cold Spring Harbor since 1968. Um, but by 1987 was beginning 
to get into the very early discussions and, and conceptualization of what eventually became the Human Genome Project. And of course, Jim became the founding director of the, of the Institute. Um, and at that point, the, the, the laboratory had become a rather complicated place. There, were, there was a DNA learning center, that which, which was aimed at high school students. There was um, an expanding meetings and courses operation. There was the, Ban the Banbury Center. And Jim had a, a major hand in all of these developments. Um, and essentially, and publishing, of course, had been embedded in the lab's functionality since 1933. But, and Jim was the architect of a great deal of that, including the expansion of the meetings and courses, which took the, which were the seed for many monographs in important topics in molecular biology. I mean, in the 70s and 80s, um, a lot of what came out of the lab was the literature of molecular <coughs> biology, and molecular cloning, the lab manual, was an exemplar of that. There was a course uh, in uh, this new recombinant DNA technology, and uh, run uh, taught by a number of a number of people, and it became uh, the basis for this lab manual. And a lab manual at that stage was a very um, unusual. Um, uh, um, form of media in, in molecular biology, but there was an immense hunger to learn what these techniques could do and how to do them. And this was, uh, uh, it was literally a cookbook. It was often called a cookbook. It was often called a Bible, the Bible of molecular cloning, of, of, of molecular biology, because it had very detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to do all the things that you needed to do to take advantage of this new set of technologies. And it came out in 1982, a first. It was an absolute phenomenon. Um, it spread across the world. I think it really should be recognized as a major vector for the spread of recombinant mm -hmm. DNA through all the research communities in the world. And the publications department at the lab was, was just that. It was a department of the administration. Um, and suddenly they found that they were selling 60,000 copies of this book, which was a, a huge accomplishment in, at any time, but particularly in those days. Wow. So publishing was embedded in Cold Spring Harbor and had been for a long time. Jim realized that, he, that this needed more than the attention that he could give to it. Um, uh, genes and development had got started under the uh, guidance of a, a dear friend of mine and former colleague, Steve Prentice, who tragically was killed before even the, on, in a car crash, before wow. even the first issue of genes and development came out. So now Jim had you know, a burgeoning um, book program, now he had a journal and he decided to look for someone who would be willing to come and take charge of that. And his search led to me. Um, I remember vividly having dinner at his invitation with him in London, in which we talked about all kinds of things, a vision for a university press with expansion in journals and expansion in books. And um, I also remember going back and saying to my wife, we lived in Cambridge, went back on the train and said, how would you like to live in America for a couple of years? And she said, why the hell would I want to do that? Um, hey. but, but she is a person of, of, with an adventurous spirit. And so we came to America for a couple of years. You know, our children were eight and six. Uh, and um, we... Um, we, we were, we've been here ever since and very happily. So we've expanded, the press has expanded. Um, we now have nine journals. Um, we have 200 books in print. We have electronic books. We have books online. And um, I guess really the, 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 the logic behind the expansion has always been, what can we do as a publisher that is useful to the community? And, um, everything that we do is run through that metric. So um, for example, we started a journal in 1991 devoted exclusively to PCR at a time when PCR was a new technology, it was expanding wow. and uh, developing in a variety of ways. 
We knew that this would not last, but we thought we'll start it and then we'll see where we go from there. And where we went from there was its evolution into uh, genome research. And we have, we had editors um, of this journal in 1991, which included a promising young man called Eric Green um, and, uh, and, and Rick Myers and Richard Gibbs, now all extremely eminent and senior people in the field of genomics. And much to our gratification, they are still involved. They are still committed to the journal. They're, they have colleagues now um, in addition, but um, that's been a tremendous journey for, um, for that particular journal. And we are immensely proud of what it has done for and with the genomics community. So um, I'm talking too much about this, but it is, it is a story that we're very proud of. And um, the press is a very well-established part of the um, expansiveness of the laboratory, and, and we contribute to the lab in a whole variety of ways, financially, but also in terms of reputation, but also in terms of the service that we want our publications to give to the community. Yeah, that's great. And of course, uh, with Genome Research, the current editor, Hilary Sussman, is amazing and a good friend, so I wanted to, to call her out too. So we're going to talk more about how your publishing experience factors in in a little bit. But first, I want to alert people to the fact that you've also been an author, and you haven't shied away from controversial areas, including your 2008 book on the geneticist Charles Davenport and the history of eugenics. So this is an area where our institute has a history program that is continually working to ensure there's proper context and recognition of harms that were done in the past. So can you comment on what you think is the current state of things? I know that book came out in 2008, so it's been a little while, but any, any, do you want to share any thoughts on how to ensure we don't repeat past mistakes? Well, I mean, I think the way uh, someone said, you know, the way to um, avoid the, the repeat of history is to know the history. And I think the lab, the period, I mean, the lab was founded in 1890, and there was a period in the 20s when it was the, um, the locus of um, the eugenics record office under the guidance of the, the founding director of one of the institutes that merged eventually to form Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. We, uh, and it's not, you know, we as an institution want that history to be known and we have um, made that known in a variety of ways. Our DNA Learning Center, which is oriented towards um, high school students, has a very good online um, uh, project that, that illustrates the history of eugenics as seen through the lens of the Eugenics Record Office. Um, the, our book, uh, the book that Jan Witkowski and I edited, we didn't, we didn't write it, but we okay. assembled essays from a variety of um, authorities uh, in both the history and, and the analysis and the, of, um, of the eugenics movement and people who were capable of reflecting on what those lessons are for now. And we've, we've continued to focus uh, a, a bit on that. We have um, one of Elof Carlson's book, The Unfit, is called, the subtitle is The History of a Bad Idea. And he traces this notion of, of mm -hmm. unfit families uh, in a human context. Um, we have another book edited by Aravinta Chakravarti about human uh, genetic variation, which has a variety of really terrific contributions. So I think where we are now is that there is uh, a, a, an ever increasing recognition that we need to learn the lessons from the past. Yeah. And in fact, Angela Saini's excellent book called Superior um, ha is, is it, it basically is a warning that we are at risk of, of allowing race science to re-enter the conversation. And what we have to do is ensure that investigators um, uh, young scientists and people who are doing science now are aware of the, the risks, the biases that may be built into the, the construction of trials, the interpretation of data, and, and that we need, a, we need to continually remind ourselves that race is not a biological uh, entity, but a social construct. And, and, and that needs to be kept very firmly in mind as we go forward. 
And I think- Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. It's very much part of that. Absolutely, yeah, I'm sorry to, to cut you off there. Yeah, absolutely, we, we agree with that. And, and I, we're gonna talk about that, I know, in future installments of this same series, yeah. in addition to our bold prediction series. So uh, before we Dorothy, leave- um, um, Sorry, uh, you have Dorothy Roberts on your uh, list of speakers who is far, I mean, she's an authority on this. I am definitely not. So I will look forward to your to the conversation with her. Me too. Yeah, no, she does great work too. So we do have one question from the audience, uh, which gets to what we were talking about a minute ago, which is what sort of review practices were slash are in place with the nine journals published by Cold Spring Harbor? Perhaps. Well, um, they vary um, from one journal to, an, to another, but um, you know, I, I, as you know, peer review is in a process of enormous change right now, and there are lots of different models. There are lots. There are lots of experiments going on to try to make um, peer review more open, more transparent, and um, more equitable. And um, we are looking at all of those experiments and talking to those people who are carrying them out. I would say we are not. As a publisher, we are not in the, uh, as far as the journals are concerned, we are not in the forefront of doing these, these new things. We, what we're trying to do with each of the communities that the journals serve is get a sense of what the constituencies of these journals want. And I think the genomics community has already signaled that it is perhaps in the forefront of a desire for openness, both in terms of the ac access to content and the way that um, activities like peer review is uh, uh, is done. So we we are explore we are looking and and considering what to do in terms of uh, evolving our peer peer review processes. But our our newest journal, um, Life Science Alliance, which is a, a joint venture we're doing with EMBO and Rockefeller University, we are, for example, there we are posting the reviews of published papers alongside the papers uh, on the journal website. We are not the first to do that, but we have been encouraged by the experience of people like EMBO who've been doing this for a whole variety of years. But I think, well, I know we're going to talk about preprints later, but um, one of the consequences, I think, of the um, in increased enthusiasm for preprints is that it's good, that enthusiasm is going to have effects on the way that peer review is done at the level of the journal. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that is what we're going to talk about in just a second. But we have one more question that's come in. Do you see Cold Spring Harbor Press moving toward an open access model and perhaps even an open review model? I think you addressed that a little. But. Yes, um, I, I could see us going to an open review model um, uh, soon. I think one of the um, one of the big questions that is always part of the discussion about open review is whether reviewers should be named or should right. name themselves. Right. And, and um, we have a lot of conversation about that. The, the, the concerns about that are the potential career uh, risks, particularly yeah. young investigators or to young early career researchers, um, who are concerned, not unreasonably, that by being public in their criticism of people who are more senior, there will be some consequences in, in career terms. I, I think that's a very real concern. Um, it's one that we just, I think we need to have that conversation in the community and it is happening. There are bold individuals out there who say, if you're going to be a scientist, you should make your opinions known publicly and stand behind it. And it doesn't matter what stage in your career you're at. Well, that's it's a point of view often advanced by those who are already senior. It that is that is often pointed out, but it's not exclusive to the senior people. There are bold pioneers amongst the young people as well, and that's really interesting to see. Um, in terms of open access, at the moment, we have had what is usually called a hybrid model for, I don't know, a decade or more, in which 
if uh, an individual author wants to make her paper open access, then there is a mechanism for doing that. But the financial basis for our journals currently, except for the more recent ones, um, I'm talking about the four research journals, the financial model is at the moment a subscription model. However, we are just at the beginning of introducing uh, a new way of getting access to Cold Spring Harbor content, which is what we call the Cold Spring Harbor collection. And this is negotiated at an institutional or perhaps consortial level and for um, an agreed um, financial uh, cost. Then the uh, faculty in that institution or within that consortium will have both the opportunity to read the, all of the Cold Spring Harbor content, including the review journals, um, free of charge, and also the opportunity to publish in all of those journals, including wow. those that are currently subscription journals, they will have that opportunity free of charge. So we've already done one of these kinds of an, uh, arrangements with uh, the British uh, consortium JISC, and we are gradually reaching out to more and more institutions with this proposition. Um, obviously, we've, had, we've been party to all the discussions that have gone on about open access. In fact, I claim to have organized the first con ever conference about open access for publishers at our Banbury meeting in 2001, which was a complete failure. And looking back, <laughs> Looking back, I can't believe my naivety and imagine that simply by getting a bunch of people in a room who represent enormous international you know, um, uh, companies yeah. and others from the not-for-profit sector, that somehow we could make this all work. That was- and just like magic. Yeah. Totally yeah. naive. Um, but um, I think open access for scientific content is inevitable. And the question is, how can we get there without destroying, in the process, many of the journals that our community values most, society journals in particular, mm -hmm. and, and not-for-profits like ours. And we think that for us, this model that we're adopting is the right one. But there are many others, as you know. And they're right. no, absolutely. at the same time. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's the biggest question, right? Is to figure out the money and everything. So we've talked about preprints a little, so I'm going to go ahead and, and have us jump into that. Um, uh, and to uh, just remind people, they can get sent in questions in the Q&A function and we'll be able to see them. So one of the, the recent way, one of the most recent ways you've revolutionized publishing is to co-found the preprint service BioArchive and MedArchive, as I mentioned. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that I've been involved in BioArchive and still screen papers as an affiliate, so I look at them too. This one was a massive task. I don't know if people who have ever used to understand the true scale of everything that you had to do in setting this up, you and Richard, not just infrastructure, but culture change, like you mentioned, and your meeting funding shifts still going on. Can you give us an update on BioArchive and MedArchive? And then where do you see them going in the future? And, and you might want to start by uh, defining preprints again one more time. So a preprint is very simply a, a research manuscript that uh, an author decides to distribute publicly um, through a means generally called a preprint server, which is a website devoted to the distribution of preprints. And um, they do that um, either before or maybe simultaneously with the submission of that manuscript to a journal um, so that that information becomes freely accessible. All preprint servers are free to access. You don't have to, um, well, some of them you have to register for, but, but generally speaking, the, the content is available to anyone to, to look at. And um, also uh, most, I, I don't think I can think of a preprint server that, that charges for um, the, um, for the distribution of that content. So um, there are preprints, servers now in, I think there are about 50 of them. They serve different mm -hmm. disciplines, scholarly disciplines. They may serve a certain country, a certain language. Um, in 2013, when we embarked on this enterprise of BioArchive, basically there were 
possibly three preprint servers, the most famous and the, the grandmother of them all being Archive, which is, of course, why buy Archive. And Archive had been, has it's celebrating its 30th year this year. Uh -huh. um, and so if you talk to physicists and mathematicians, Archive is absolutely central to how they think about sharing their research. And um, we came, I mean, by, so um, this by, archive was built on existing practices of sharing manuscripts in, in print. People just did that. They did that a little bit in biology too, but I think not to the same extent. And part of this was because the way that peer review works in say mathematics, it takes, you know, a year or two years, you know, it's a very, very different process. So, so mathematicians and physicists began to share their work in this way. And Paul Ginspark saw the promise of the web as a means of making that distribution and that sharing more efficient. Um, we, when journals went online, which basically in our case was around 1997, then we started to meet, we who were sort of siloed in biomedicine, we started to meet people who published in mathematics and physics and so on. And because we went to meetings like the one that the National Academy has every couple of years, and these people would talk about this, about archive. And I actually met Paul Ginspark at a Banbury meeting, and we had a long talk about what he was doing. And I remember thinking at the time, that is so not going to work in biomedicine. Yeah. I mean, in that 30 year span, there were at least, you know, three or four attempts to introduce preprints to biomedicine, which did not work. Yeah. In 2013, and again, we come back to genomics here. In 2013, Richard and I talked about this and thought, you know, now is the time. We just yeah. had a hunch that now is the time to try again. And some of that was because of the culture of genomics, which had flourished by sharing, sharing data, sharing code, um, you know, early adoption of, of uh, open access. And we, we just had a feeling that, that if, if nothing else happened, at least genomic science, genome scientists would use and appreciate a bioarchive. And I have to say, with no discussion um, or argument or doubts. Um, Bruce Stillman, the lab president said, I think it's a great idea, do it. And then I think you were part of a, a meeting that we had at the Biology of Genomes meeting in 2013, yep. where we got a bunch of people like you and others, Leonid Krukliak was there and other folks that we'd invited. It was a lunchtime meeting. We said, this is what we're thinking about. What do you think? And basically everybody said, Terrific, go for it. So we did in November of that year. And it was as we predicted. The, the genome scientists and uh, geneticists were early adopters. Evolutionary biologists were too. And since then, it has grown and grown. So last year, BioArchive had posted 38,000 manuscripts. <laughs> um, and... Um, it's continuing to grow. And then inspired by the momentum of BioArchive, we, uh, we launched MedArchive in 2019. And, and we had been very encouraged by the appearance of a, an op-ed piece in the New York Times by Harlan Krumholtz and Eric Trompoff saying, this thing that's happening in biology, medicine needs this too. So Harlan is one of the co-founders of MedArchive. Right, you read that op-ed as a volunteer, a call for volunteer, <laughs> right? And enlisted him. <laughs> Absolutely, and um, I'm sure he would he would recognize that too. And and we this so MedArchive is a partnership between Cold Spring Harbor, Yale University, where where um, Harlan and his colleague Joe Ross are, and BMJ. And BMJ had a clinical preprint server in the 90s which didn't take off. So they had a sort of collective, we all had collective interest in doing this. And it's turned out to be a really fabulous partnership because Joe and Harlan bring a very, you know, clinical in the trenches perspective to 
evaluation of policy and manuscripts. And, and uh, Theo and Claire are embedded in a major um, medical publishing house. And scientific publishing is different to medical publishing. So we have a multi a multiplexed sort of approach to this. And it's 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 turning out to be a great project and it too is is growing. It's only two yeah, years. So, so were there ever times as you were setting these both up where you were like, right, that's it, this is too hard, this is just not gonna work, or no? No, I, I honestly don't think so. I mean, uh, we were immensely encouraged, um, first of all, well, first of all, Bioarch I've got started by just co-opting people who are already working here. I mean, it was, it was just an additional effort, but everybody was really jazzed by being involved in this, you know, this thing and, and this novel thing and something that right out of the box, people would communicate, they'd write to us and say, there is such pleasure to be had in sharing my work without obstacles, without hindrances, when I want to. And, um, you know, people were really heartfelt about that. And that in itself, I and mean, talk about providing a service to scientists, that, which is what we try to do here, that was the, the, the most gratifying thing of all. I mean, some really very moving stories that we heard during that time. So um, I think we always thought we could do this. It was immensely helped when we, we got, initially we got financial help from one of the trustees of Cold Spring Harbor. And then the brand new Chan Zuckerberg initiative sought us out and said, you know, tell us about what you're doing, and we did, and they basically said they would like to fund BioArchive. And so we enjoyed generous funding from them since uh, 2017, and then they were also kind enough to come in and support MedArchive uh, last year. So we've yeah. been very fortunate. We've been able to scale. We've been able to hire a dedicated team now. Um, and um, it's, um, you know, it's just, it's in all the things that I have been involved in, in scientific communication, I think this is in many ways the most gratifying. Because oh. we, are, we are serving the largest number of people. I mean, we have seven to eight million downloads a month. We have, you know, thousands and thousands of papers every, every month. And the enthusiasm for this change in the way that scientists share their work, this enthusiasm yeah. is growing all the time. So we have a, a few um, questions that are still coming in and there a number of them are about media. So we're gonna get to those in a minute. We're gonna come to the role of media, but I'm gonna take one question because it's from my boss. Um, assuming preprints eventually become mainstream, how much of that acceptance will be because of institutional and cultural change of the current ecosystem versus generational change from younger researchers as they take over leading our ecosystem? Um, well, um, as always, Eric has very good questions. Um, Frankly, I think it's all of the above. Um, there is an absolutely no question that the initial enthusiasm for preprints in biomedicine was led by younger scientists. And um, you could say that that's because they were the ones who felt most frustrated by the way that the uh, communication system has, the traditional publication system has worked. You know, if you're a a young investigator and you have a three-year grant, you have to do the work, you have to write it up, you have to get it accepted in a journal, which may take a year or longer. Um, that's a, a huge pressure. Um, and the, one of the benefits of, a pre, of, a, of, of posting a preprint is the demonstration to anybody who wants to look like a funding body or a hiring committee or whatever, a demonstration of product productivity. Um, it's there, it's got a DOI, it's findable, it's freely right. available. And the NIH has agreed that those can be cited in biosketches, which was a crucial moment for me as well, yeah. That's absolutely. what I was going to go on and say, that institute funder support, including NIH, but also other, other funders, um, they're, 
their support for preprints, encouragement for preprints, that has been absolutely crucial to their growing acceptance. And I, you know, I, I am very wary of saying words like success and so on. We, even at 38,000 manuscripts on BioArchive last year and another 4,000 on um, MedArchive, uh, 14,000 on MedArchive, I should say, even so, that's a tiny proportion of all of the research papers that your colleagues at the National Library of Medicine index. Yeah. So we have a long way to go before that culture change um, happens. But I'm confident that it will happen. And um, minds are being changed. More people are doing this and learning from it, learning that the experience is beneficial. So I think that the momentum will continue. But to, to answer Eric's question, I think we need all of the above. We, yeah. need, we need institutions, I mean, academic institutions. We need funding institutions to continue to be as supportive as they have been. And, and we certainly need advocacy within the research community itself. And, and that's particularly true in medicine where this is still very um, you know, uh, new. Well, so in fact, along those same lines, um, we, you, uh, together with Richard Sever and Mike Eisen, uh, proposed an ap approach that you call Plan U for Universal. We've also gotten a question, which is what's the long-term funding plan for your preprint servers? And I think maybe that falls into the discussion of Plan U. So can you tell us what all is involved? You said in your preprint or in your paper, which we're going to show a second, you said that this would bring about, quote, free access to the world's scientific output with minimal effort, unquote. So tell us a little more about that. Well, so it was, it was the plan U term was partly a sort of little in-joke because um, as anyone in scholarly publishing knows, there is an effort largely rooted in Europe called Plan S, um, and it's not even sure clear what S actually stands for, but it is Plan S, which is a, a mobilization of a consortium of funders to um, force progress towards open access through the medium of journals. And what struck us was that um, preprints, which are easy to post, free to post, if more, if more people did that, then you would have a massive corpus that represents um, an enormous amount of the, the world's scientific output. I mean, we have we have uh, contributions right now on both servers from 140 plus countries. So it is a worldwide phenomenon. And if more people presented their work in this way, then the at least the author's version of their work would be mm -hmm. readily available to communities worldwide. Now, the question then becomes, well, but this is the author's version. What about what everybody else thinks of it? And so as a corollary to this proposal, what we said was, if there is a, a, a critical mass of information available as preprints, then this allows experimentation in how to change how peer review is done. The point about a preprint or a preprint server is that it just it uncouples the traditional function of a journal, which was those functions traditionally were both selectivity and distribution. What a preprint server does is not to make to have any selectivity yeah. apart from, you know, passing, Bare minimum. passing some submission requirements that you are very familiar with. Yeah. So we we allow people to distribute first and then the quality, the the assessment, the evaluation, um, the, the discussion of significance, all happens after the information is, is available to everyone. And in that way, at the very least, you can bring in many, many more voices into the conversation about a given piece of work than you can do through the conventional peer review process, which as you know, is limited to you know, three or four uh, people conducted largely privately, um, and with, with the ability to have public commentary, which we have on the site, and with the use of social media such as Twitter, then you can have a very broad-ranging and multi-voiced conversation 
about a given piece of work. So that was really what we were trying to articulate in that article. Um, and like I said, use the universal. But how are we going to get there? We already have enthusiasm from uh, funders. What we need is mandating preprints from funders. And there are already a small number that are doing that. Um, the others have not yet got there, but perhaps they're considering that. So that's a crucial part of, of Plan U is, is the, having funders mandate that. And that's where the funding comes from, is that the funders are mandating it in work that they're already paying for, if I understand you. Yes, that, that's right. And I mean, you also asked the question about the, the long-term future of funding for pre and service. Well, um, at the moment, we are very um, fortunate to have philanthropic funding from um, a funder who sees the communication of science as integral with the doing of science and the funding of science itself. And I, it would be our hope that other funders would see the communication piece as something that they should do the process of, of preprints as something that they should, they should fund and they should support. Yeah, exactly. Well, if only people from NIH were listening to this, then yeah. we would know. <laughs> so let me, we're getting lots of questions about the uh, media and preprints, so we're going to go to that. So what do you think would happen to the science media ecosystem as we know it if everything was preprinted first? And I, we have a graphic that we're going to show. We've seen um, some confusion in the time of COVID because the, the submissions to MedArchive just really ramped up in the time of COVID. Um, and you sent most of the uh, submissions that dealt with COVID to MedArchive instead of BioArchive. So that's part of why it's really ramped up there. But, but we've seen lots of confusion about whether science can be treated as news, whether these preprints can be treated as news, how the media deals with them. So, so tell us a little bit about how you've seen things happen with the media and preprints. Well, um, there is no question that um, COVID changed everything. Um, the, the data that you're showing there demonstrate that um, uh, that in January of 2020, um, in the second half of January, there were 30 papers, 30 manuscripts on SARS-CoV-2 um, posted to BioArchive. And uh, most of them came from China. So this was the this was the research community in China signaling to the world what they were learning, the very early stages of what became the pandemic. Um, in in um, January of 2020 on MedArchive, we had 250 manuscripts, none of them on COVID. Um, at, by May of 2020, we had 2,000 manuscripts posted to MedArchive. And a huge proportion, as you can see there, even, even in, in May, it was even bigger than 63%. Huge proportion of them were directly related to pandemic investigations, epidemiology, um, post response, um, you know, all kinds of aspects of the, the pandemic that, that the research community was learning about as it mobilized worldwide to deal with this massive problem. Um, so preprints as news became um, an important thing um, yeah. because the, the research community was sharing what it was learning with each other through the medium of preprint service, but they are open so everyone was able to read what were on these servers. And, and, and crucially, you just let me add a second here. You added disclaimers at this time to both BioArchive and MedArchive in bright yellow boxes with red type, type that says these have not been peer reviewed, right? So that's one of the ways that you were trying to make sure people understand that. Yeah, we did that on BioArchive we, um, because um, we, we learned very quickly that um, uh, papers were being picked up and circulated. Um, particularly sort of informally um, on websites that were not necessarily authoritative uh, medical websites, but websites that people were, were reading. So we felt it was important to make that statement about the, the, that all 
everything that is posted to a preprint server should be treated with caution, if not skepticism. Um, and we were trying to emphasize that. So in the early days of, in the early months of 2020, um, as you know, the media, mo the media also mobilized to cover the pandemic and people like you know, the wonderful Apoorva Mandevilli and her colleagues at the Times who were specialized, specialists in science uh, coverage, they were augmented in many news desks by people who did not have those kinds of backgrounds. So all these stories were, were uh, being written and it was, um, it was the case, and someone uh, has actually done a study of this, that in the early days of the pandemic, when stories were printed in news, or published in newspapers or reported in the media about work that existed as a preprint, then the source was not, it was not explained that the source no. was not peer reviewed. And, and there's a um, young woman in uh, British Columbia who's actually doing graduate work on this phenomenon. And uh, she, she had a paper out last year that, that showed somewhat surprisingly that even major media did not make this reference. But my contention is that this was in the early days of the pandemic when all the media was scrambling to know how to cover it. And I would say now you can see in, in current references to information that comes from preprint servers, you can see in nearly every case that there's reference to the fact that this the material has not been peer reviewed. So that's an improvement, I think. That's an improvement. There's a greater understanding of what this means. And I think what this means more generally is that the public is beginning to learn that not all scientific communication is the same. Um, and this is a hard and nuanced lesson to get across, but I think it is incumbent on journalists to make that point very clear in the stories that they write. And there's also been a lot of discussion about how preprints should be covered. Um, we say right there on the site, they should not be reported as established fact. So what, we, what I certainly personally hope is that journalists will have the opportunity to consult people other than the authors and get opinions about whether something is worthwhile or not. Does it have obvious flaws? Maybe you still want to write about it, but you want to point out the flaws that other that your um, circle of trust has, um, has provided to you. So, I mean, the, the, big, the big question comes when you ask, what is an institutional responsibility here? Should, in other words, should, should institutions press release preprints? And this is a purely personal opinion. I don't think they should. And one of the reasons is that the purpose of a pre press release is to provide clear didactic statements about a particular piece of work. And they are not, institutional press releases are not noted for nuance and caveat. And that's what should be attached to preprints. Um, nuance and caveat. And so my personal opinion is that institutions should not press release um, preprinted work, but not everyone agrees with that. And um, it's, it's a topic of conversation. Yeah, no, it's very difficult. Our, our communications team has talked about it quite a bit because it feels like they, I can see that it would feel like they're missing out on a lot of the press on big preprints, whereas, uh, you know, do they have to wait and have, for example, our press team at NHGRI is really great about doing animations and, and that kind of those kind of materials around big papers and so that they have to wait and maybe a lot of the news media has already happened and so it won't get be covered as much. It's a really difficult problem in there. So we're getting lots of questions. I want to work one in here. Someone has asked, I work in medical communications and have found Med Archive endlessly fruitful, fruitful, but given the importance of universal access, how can we start to move towards plain language summaries of these papers? Is this something that is planned as a future option for manuscript submissions? Well, this is a question that's been asked many times. And, and I, I do think that particularly in medicine, I do think that plain language um, abstracts are valuable for the broad audience. I don't think it's something that we will do. We 
We don't have the resources. We don't have the expertise. That is not to say that someone couldn't start a service of picking out particularly interesting preprints and providing that plain language um, uh, summary. I think that would be a very useful service and probably journalists would like to have access to such a service were it to exist. But it's certainly not part of our roadmap for how uh, we have quite enough on our hands without doing that too. And it, you know, I've done some journalism a long, long time ago and I know how difficult it is to write for that broad audience. So I take my hat off to all of you in the audience who are trying to do that. It is a skill and shouldn't be taken lightly. And you, it's not something you can generally ask authors to do. No, indeed, because we're already doing so much and the editors are already doing so much. And yeah, everyone is stressed throughout the entire ecosystem. So another question that we got in advance, uh, there are fears of being scooped by putting out a preprint. Are there any data related to this? Um, I'm not aware of data, but the, 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 the whole point really of a preprint is that it is an anti-scooping mechanism. You know, I mean, the thing goes up um, at the time when you, the author, want it to, there's a date stamp that will show exactly when it was posted or when it was approved for posting. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about this and it's certainly one of the um, hesitations that always comes up amongst research scientists when they talk about preprints. But quite honestly, I, I, I think it's a misunderstanding. I, I think that um, by posting a preprint, you are telling the world that we did this work and this is how we did it. And this is when we decided to share it. Now, um, there are in fact journals, our colleagues at Embo Press, I think were the first ones to initiate what they call an anti-scooping policy. In other words, if um, someone submits a, a, a research article to their journals, and then during the time that article is being considered for publication, there is a competing article on a preprint server, then the existence of that preprint will not influence the editorial decision. Um, I, and I think that's a, that's a great thing for them to do. But um, I really feel that, um, as, as I said, I think that posting a preprint is a way of uh, claiming or showing the world that you, the work that you did. Uh, and then it's up to the community to evaluate whether your conclusions are justified by the data and the way you did it. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I give talks on bioarchive all the time, too, and I tell people I really think that's more field specific as well. If I were a human geneticist who had found a certain mutation that underlied a disease, I might not be so interested in doing a preprint because I think that could be scooped more easily than if I did, you know, sequence telomere to telomere, for example. That's not something someone's going to go out and probably scoop us all. <laughs> but so, yeah, I think it's also field specific, too. I mean, it, what's interesting in talking to physicists who've been, you know, using archive for 30 years, and I remember in the early days of bioarchive, someone said to me, you, uh, someone in Cambridge actually said to me, you know, I don't put everything on archive. <laughs> but, so I, I, I tried to find out why, you know, what would he put on archive and what wouldn't, but he was a bit reluctant to be drawn about it. So I think... <laughs> I think culture change happens slowly. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what Eric was getting at. That's exactly right. So, and, and that's leading us to one of the other questions we got, which was, can we expect a culture in the future where preprints are cited alongside their peer-reviewed counterparts? Oh, I think that's happening already. Yeah. I forgot, yeah, I agree. I've forgotten the number, but there's, I mean, I think there is, um, there's a database that you can look at to, to look at kind of citations. I was, Amazed. I think there is some, I may be wrong about the number, but it's roughly speaking, it's in the, the tens of thousands. There are tens of thousands of, pre, of, of citations to med archive um, uh, papers already in the literature, which is amazing when you consider that med archive is two years old. There are only, you know, like 19,000 um, uh, manuscripts on the service. So, um, I, I think the idea, and I know there was at the beginning, there was discussion among people in scholarly publishing about whether preprints should be cited. Some people said, oh no, they should be regarded as a personal communication and not put in the revered 
reference list at the end of the article. Um, but I, I honestly do not think that that's uh, justifiable. There's still conversation, and this is something, this is a decision that is taken by individual publishers or maybe individual journals. There's still a desire among some to annotate that citation of, say, you know, preprint. And you ask, well, why do you want to do that? And the answer is, well, because it's not peer reviewed, which leads to the obvious question, well, what other kinds of citations are not peer reviewed? You know, book chapters, symposium proceedings, you know, there's websites. A bunch of things, websites, yeah, there's a bunch of things. So, yeah. So we have one more question. I think you've addressed this a little, but I want to get it across as well. In the past six, uh, 18 months, a growing number of journalists have covered papers posted to bioarchive, especially related to COVID, as we talked about. Is this appropriate or useful to the public? I think you've talked about that a little, but their real question is, how could journalists, and in parentheses they say, I am one, do a better job in covering or not covering papers posted to bioarchive? Well, I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier about consulting um, people, uh, con con taking advice. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, this is, this is complicated stuff and, and, and journalists are generalists, they are not specialists. So uh, no one would expect a journalist to be able to critically evaluate a research manuscript that she finds on BioArca. Mm -hmm. However, that journalist may well have in her local area, she will have a university or a research institute. And I think it's really helpful for journalists to have a group of specialists that she trusts and can go to. And, and most scientists are really eager to help other people understand what science is and what this means and so on. So I, I think it's not hard for journalists to develop, I used the term circle of trust earlier, but to have input from people just to say, this sounds great, but the methodology is flawed. Or these guys are, you know, overselling their conclusions. Or maybe they say, you know, this is really terrifically important and it's going to be terribly helpful in investigating this disease. You know, there, there are all kinds of things that could happen. So that's what I, that's what I would strongly recommend is um, journalists developing a network of people that they can consult. Um, I think Apurva mentioned that in her right. conversation with you the last time. I and mean, she, she certainly has those sorts of people. And, and I think it's fantastically helpful. Oh, that's so great. Okay, we have about three minutes left, so I'm gonna ask you one more question and a 30 second answer. How can preprints be better used to communicate the impact or successes of research initiatives? Well, I, I, I think they are part of the record of achievement of, of a given, you know, a, a given initiative. We were talking about a particular project. They, they, they should be counted as part of the outputs from that research project. And they can be cited, they can be, they can be identified, they can be found. So they are part of uh, the record of achievement of a particular research group. Yeah, I agree with you. And I would also add, and I'm not quite sure if it's what they're asking, but um, there is a section which I end up uh, reviewing a lot of the um, submissions for it on my archive site called Science Communication and Education. And I see a number of people putting in papers there, which are not pure science per se, but are more about um, looking at how research initiatives have done, like some of the open science things, et cetera. So that, that's another place where people could submit to my archives in that section as well. Yeah, we have that, that communication section. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, John Inglis. I think you could tell there was lots of uh, interest in, in everything that you're doing, and we really appreciate it. Um, I want um, to mention also that we have our next speakers coming up, I think in, in a month or two, I'm not sure, oh, September 20th. Amy Harmon, another correspondent from the New York Times who covers more science and society, will be uh, interviewed as part of the series. So I invite everyone to do that. Um, and, and come to those and we can continue some of the discussions that we have with John. And again, John, thank you so much. We really appreciate being here. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. It's been fun. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of this.